Today's video is sponsored by Audible. With so much more time to spend indoors lately, I've been getting lost in the thousands of titles available through Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members can get one credit to pick any title, and now members get unlimited access to each month's selection of Audible originals from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Now, you can download titles and listen offline, anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. You can listen across devices without losing your spot. If you can't decide what to listen to, don't worry. You can keep your credits for up to a year and use them to binge a whole series if you'd like. I personally have been getting immersed in another Stephen King classic, The Stand. This is the way the world ends, with a nanosecond of a computer error in a defense department laboratory and a million casual contacts that form the links in a chain letter of death. And here in the bleak new world of the day after, a world stripped of its institutions and emptied of 99% of its people, a world in which a handful of panicky survivors choose sides or are chosen, a world in which good rides on the frail shoulders of the 108-year-old mother Abigail, and the worst nightmares of evil are embodied in a man with a lethal smile and unspeakable powers, Randall Flagg, the Dark Man. I love this complete edition available on Audible as it includes 500 pages of material that was previously deleted from King's original manuscript. To get started with a 30-day free trial, plus one free audiobook, and unlimited access to each month's collection of originals, visit audible.com slash readcreepy or text readcreepy to 500-500. That's 30 days free, one free audiobook, and unlimited access to all Audible originals. Visit audible.com slash r-e-a-d-c-r-e-e-p-y or text readcreepy to 500-500. Hi everyone, my name is Francisco. I must apologize first because English is not my first language, so I'm sorry for any mistakes there are in writing this. I'm from Paraguay, and I live here in the capital city, Asuncion. Like many of the countries in the world, we in Paraguay have also been affected by the virus outbreak. Everyone is very worried. They have been wearing masks and buying all of the groceries so that they can stay at home until everything is safe again. But more importantly, the government here in Paraguay has declared a curfew, and people who leave their homes without a good reason can be punished by the police. Also, if you leave your home and you are sick, you can be charged with a crime and thrown into jail. But the problem is that a lot of people in here in Asuncion are very poor, and even those who work make very little money. That means that both me and my father have to work to support our family. Even my mother makes and sells wicker baskets in her free time to give our family extra money. But that's where the trouble started. When the government here decided which of our jobs were essential and which ones were not. I had a part-time job in the tourism industry, giving guided tours of the markets and historical sites of Asuncion. But this was declared non-essential right away after the lockdown was declared. So just like that, I was out of work. My father is a supervisor at a manufacturing plant on the outskirts of the city. So for a while, he was still able to bring home money since he was declared an essential worker. But that all changed when he was tested at his job for the virus. When the test came back positive, he was told he would have to go home and isolate himself for two weeks before he would be allowed to return to work. This was a disaster for our family, but there was one flicker of hope. The head of my father's department told him that a temporary replacement had been found for him, but that left a space on the factory floor, one that I could occupy for the time he was sick. So every morning for about a week, I would wake up very early, grab my father's ID card, walk out of town for an hour so I could work the line at the manufacturing plant. It was a very boring job, 
much more boring than my tour guide work, but I was still very grateful to have the chance to keep earning money for my family. My family owns a car that we share, but since money was low and we couldn't afford too much gas, we had to save it for emergencies. That is why, like I may have said already, that I ended up walking four miles there in the morning and four miles back home in the nighttime. It was tough going, and I was stopped by the police many times, but all I had to do was show them my father's factory ID card, and they would wave me on. But that only worked so many times, and one evening a routine police check led to one of the most terrifying, stressful experiences of my entire life. I was walking at the side of the road, my feet aching after a long day on the line, when I heard the momentary blare of a siren behind me. I stopped walking, turned around, and I saw a police vehicle parking up near me. Usually, I would just show the ID card and the police would drive on without getting out of their car. But this time, both officers stepped out of the vehicle and began marching towards me with a lot of aggression. I tried to show them the ID card to explain that I was an essential worker working in place of my father, but they didn't want to listen. This is not your picture, one of the officers said asserting that I could not be a supervisor and suggesting that I had in fact stolen the ID from somebody. I swore to him that it was not true, that I had made arrangements and my family might starve without the income. Then, they searched me. When I asked what they were looking for, one of the officers got in my face and told me to shut my mouth, that I was lucky that they weren't just taking me to jail since I was out spreading the virus. I think they were searching me for drugs, but I can't be sure. I know a lot of dealers have been caught recently since they need to sell their stuff and have trouble explaining why they are outdoors during a lockdown. When they had finished their search and found nothing, I thought that they might just let go of me, but I was terrified to see one of the officers take out their electric taser gun, arm it, and aim it in my direction. I didn't think. I just raised my hands like it was second nature, showing him I meant them no harm and praying he wouldn't pull the trigger. The other officer reached into the pocket of his uniform, taking out his phone and pointing the camera in my direction. It was clear that he was filming me, but for what purpose, I was scared to know. I really thought I was going to be tased on camera, that they used the video as an example to others. Then the officer with the camera said something that I struggled to understand at first. 50 star jumps, right now! At first, I honestly thought I didn't hear his words correctly. These were words I had not heard since high school physical education class. I told the officer I didn't understand, but this only made him furious. Are you deaf? Or just stupid, boy? He barked at me. Fifty star jumps. Go, hurry. I simply did as I was told. I started doing the star jumps while the officers laughed, commenting that this is what happens to those that break curfew without a good reason. Repeat after me. One of them said, I'm sorry, officer. I will not leave my house again. Uh, I'm sorry, officer. I will not leave my house again. I repeated, Again! And I did so. Again! I said the words and jumped on the spot until I had no more breath in my lungs. I was still convinced that they would tase me when it was done, that the punishment wasn't over. But when I collapsed feet and lungs burning from the work, they just carried on laughing as they got back into the car and drove away. These hard times are difficult enough without horrible policemen taking advantage of their power. I know they are not like that all over the world, that there are always a few bad people to many good ones, but I just pray that no one else has to go through what I suffered that evening. Good luck everyone, and be safe. Life can be very hard here in the Philippines. And here in Quezon, the largest city in my country, and the place where I live, life has gotten even harder since one man came to power back in 2016. Rodrigo Roa Duterte. He is often described in the same way as the American president, Donald Trump. People say he is a populist and an agitator, but 
Honestly, our president makes Trump look like an angel. Duterte has been a very vocal supporter of the extrajudicial killings of drug dealers and those that do business with them. I know that certain human rights organizations have estimated that Duterte has been directly and indirectly responsible for almost 1,500 murders committed by what has been come to be known as the Davo Death Squads. There, they murdered without a care, even sometimes targeting children in their attempt to clean up the streets. It was bad back then, but it got even worse after 2016 when he became president, and the more I think about it, the more it seems like his entire reign was building up to today, when extenuating circumstances have meant that he is more power than ever before. Quezon has reacted to the COVID-19 crisis in a very similar way to other places. We have lockdowns, mandatory self-isolation, and food rationing. And naturally, the police force has been granted considerably more power in light of such an extreme health emergency. It seems to be quite a unique situation, in that the government has increased powers and civil liberties have all but been suspended. And yet, there is absolutely no outrage or protest from the people. They are scared, and scared people are very, very easy to control. They don't just accept the introduction of draconian punishment, they welcome it. And for me, a firm believer in human rights, it is a very, very scary time indeed. For example, just a few days ago I was walking to the market to buy essential food supplies when I saw a large crowd gathered near the market square. Hundreds of people were jostling for position to catch a glimpse of whatever it was that was hidden from my view, and they were quickly being dispersed by police who obviously were under orders not to let people congregate at all. When the crowd thinned out, only then could I see what they were looking at. It was a small cage, maybe only a couple of square feet in size, no higher than a man's thigh. I recognized it as a dog cage from the sturdy steel bars, the kind us Filipinos keep our pets in to keep them safe at night. But there was no dog in the cage. It was a man. He looked terrible, like he'd not eaten or slept in days, and worst of all, this was all taking place under the midday sun. He was being baked alive in public, with only the police throwing the occasional cup of water over him to keep him from passing out from heat stroke. I was in shock. I just stood there for a moment as masked individuals filed past me, staring at the man's fingers as he hooked them through the bars of the cage and begged for help. Too big, too big, he said over and over again. Water, water. A masked policeman approached him, tossing another cup of lukewarm water over the cage's bars. The man reacted like an animal lapping at the bars of the cage to catch a few droplets in his mouth, trying to catch what little he could on his fingers and palms, then licking them desperately out of pure manic thirst. The police just laughed as he did so. But I didn't. I couldn't even move. All I could do was stare at a man who had been reduced to something less than human, and it probably hadn't even taken that long to do it. Some people were recording the man on their phones from a distance, taking pictures to send to relatives and friends. I didn't even have to ask why he was locked in that cage like that because the policemen didn't waste time to tell me. Leave the area, one shouted at me, pointing towards the small steel cage, or you'll end up just like him. Tell everyone this is what happens when people don't practice social distancing, said another. I turned and walked away, very quickly, not slowing my pace until I reached the market square. When I was done, I walked straight back home, not stopping, almost flaunting my bags of groceries to any police officers that gave me looks. There was no way I was ending up in a cage like that poor man. Even if he had violated social distancing rules, there was no good reason to cage him like an animal. But the thing is, that's not even the scariest thing I've heard or seen in the past few weeks. In Cavite province, just south of Manila, two small children were forcibly locked inside an actual coffin on March 26th as punishment for violating curfew. In Bonando village, officials arrested four boys and four girls on March 19th for violating curfew. 
They forcibly cut the hair of seven of the children while the one who resisted was stripped naked and ordered to walk home. And these aren't just rumors either. These are things that I have seen videos of on WhatsApp. The Philippines already has a terrible record of criminalizing children with members of Congress attempting to lower the age of criminal responsibility from 15 to 12, with some having proposed it to be lowered to 9. If enacted, this could put more and younger children behind bars in dangerous detention facilities. And speaking of rumors... In October 2017, Rodrigo Duterte opposed passing a law against so-called fake news, saying that it would be unconstitutional as it can curtail freedom of speech. But just a few weeks ago, our president passed a law saying those who spread fake COVID-19 news may have their electronic devices confiscated, face jail time, and in some cases even be landed with an enormous 1 million Philippine peso fine. That's the equivalent of about $40,000. That's a punishment that could destroy someone's life, as we are not wealthy people here in the Philippines. I understand lies are bad and that scaremongering can cause panic, but to destroy someone's life for that is a horrifying prospect. But it only took a few days before destroying someone's life took on a very literal meaning. On this past Thursday, a 63-year-old man was shot dead after threatening village officials and police with a scythe at a virus checkpoint. Official news sources stated that the man is believed to have been drunk when he threatened village officials and police manning the checkpoint in the town of Nasipit in the southern province of Agusan del Norte. The suspect was cautioned by a village health worker for not wearing a face mask, the report said. But the suspect got angry, uttering provoking words and eventually attacked the personnel using a scythe. A lot of people here don't quite understand what is going on, only that there is an infectious disease, but not exactly how incredibly virulent it is. So please, I hear a lot of people complaining that it's very fascist to shut down society in such a way, but be grateful you are not in the Philippines where we are just as much in danger because of our government as the virus. I hope you're not all too stressed in dealing with all this lockdown stuff, and to those who have had troubling or scary stories to tell from their experiences, I'm incredibly sorry. But what I'm really enjoying is seeing this whole thing of supporting each other, I've seen some really helpful comments from people in other posts in this sub, and it's frankly inspiring to see people coming together like this during such a dark time. So maybe, hopefully, possibly, you could help or at least listen to my problem, or rather, not so much my problem, but someone else's problem too. Like a lot of people, I was pretty shocked when the government declared a lockdown here in the UK. I'm in my late 20s, so never in my life or any of my mates' lives have any of us experienced such a zealous curtailing of civil liberties. The lines at supermarkets began, road traffic dropped off to next to nothing. It's been a soft transformation of society, but a transformation nonetheless. As life changed, so did living arrangements, and one day, I noticed that the girl who lived alone in the flat below me wasn't so alone anymore. I passed her on the stairs at one point, backing off into a corridor to maintain social distancing, but noticed she wasn't alone. He was a harmless looking bloke at first, quite tall but skinny with a mess of curly sandy blonde hair. I said hi, introduced myself without all the usual handshaking and went on my way. Everything was hunky dory if I'm being perfectly honest. That was until last Friday night when something happened that gave this whole lockdown thing a whole new meaning of terrifying. It started with a few bumps and groans from downstairs. I was playing Xbox at the time, willing the hours away with that new Call of Duty Warzone game with a few mates. The floors and walls in this old Victorian flat share are pretty thick but make a loud enough noise and you can hear the bass in another apartment. So when I feel the flat shake a wee bit and hear the girl's voice, I roll my eyes and assume the worse. Uh-oh, I said down the mic. 
think the girl downstairs and her feller are getting a bit familiar. This sparked off a round of laughter and off-colored humor, and I ended up turning my TV volume up to drown out any potential sounds of copulation. It was annoying, but hey, I've got my way of killing the quarantine time. I suppose they found theirs. But it didn't end there. Soon, loud, sporadic banging sounds from the flat below was making my flat literally shake. It was actually kind of alarming. I mean, Christ almighty, those pairs seemed like they were really going at it. I mentioned it to my mates in the party chat, and we all had a little laugh at the whole thing. But then something happened that meant I wasn't laughing anymore. I heard the girl cry out. And I know what you're thinking, but trust me, if you heard what I did you'd have known something wasn't quite right too. It wasn't a cry of ecstasy, not in the least bit, but it sounded hurt, weak, terrified. As I said, I'd turned down the volume on my TV to block the sounds out, but now I was turning it right down again, muting the speakers so I could better hear what was going on. There were voices all right, and they were obviously trying to stay hushed, but you could clearly hear that some kind of heated argument was taking place. I mentioned this to the lads in the party chat and yet again they made off-colored comments like, sounds kinky, just nonsense like that. But I quickly made it clear that this was something else entirely and that I was actually kind of worried about the whole thing. We're literally talking about the prospect of it being some kind of domestic violence incident when there's yet another loud bang. So hard it makes my flat shake, only this one was followed by a similarly terrified female scream. Then there was silence. My heart is absolutely pounding at this stage. Right then, one of the lads makes a joke about smelling something funny coming from the flat below in the next couple of days, and how I might end up being the guest star of some sort of true crime documentary in the near future. Now, I like my dark humor, and I admit I'd have found that kind of thing funny if it wasn't in danger of actually happening. But given the circumstances, I was absolutely terrified. There were no more noises coming from the flat below. It was eerily quiet now. So I asked the lads in the party chat to bear with me because I was going to call the police. Immediately a few of them told me it was the right thing to do, that it's always better to be safe than sorry in this situation. So I do. And the dispatcher on the other end tells me to leave the front door of the building open so they can enter safely and deal with the whole situation. Only get this. The police arrive. I hear a lot of shouting downstairs. So I walk out into the hallway of the building to listen in on what's going on. Instead of actually getting in there and dealing with the whole situation, the police seem to be happy to just talk to the couple through the door of the flat. The whole social distancing thing hadn't occurred to me in the slightest when I called, and now the problem with my solution was becoming evident. The couple, within moments of the police arrival, had gone from at each other's throats to uniting to tell the police to get out of their building. They were actually shouting about a warrant and all this stuff, basically trying to find any reason to keep them out. It was nuts. I had read and heard about domestic abuse before, and this was one of the classic symptoms. Warring couples suddenly unite when someone else tries to intervene. They demand to know who'd made the call and... What I heard next had me emitting an actual uh-oh out loud. The cops bloody well told them. They straight up said, We received a call from the flat above you. They had dropped me right in it. It was quiet for the rest of the night, and the next day I tried to avoid them entirely. But eventually I had to leave the flat to buy food. And as I did, and was walking down the stairs towards the front door of our building... The girl below's flat opens up, and I see a figure standing in the doorway. He was wearing a mask, one of those surgical ones, they've been popular since the outbreak, but it's clearly the abusive boyfriend, and he's holding a hammer, a bloody claw hammer, and he's just staring at me. I raise my hands and try to explain that I only meant well, but... He just slams the door on me before I can finish my explanation. And that's how it's been for the past few days now. 
me being completely terrified for my life, locking my doors constantly and listening out for heavy footsteps coming up the stairs towards my flat. So seriously, if anyone has any advice or examples on how to deal with this, please, please leave them in the comments. I'll be reading every single one and responding to those I think can help via DM. My neighbor Gary has lived across the street from our house ever since we moved in. He's a nice guy, like perennially nice. Never has a bad word to say about anyone, always sees the best in people. He never fails to see things in a positive light and has been a welcome fixture at every barbecue or block party we've ever thrown. But this latest crisis has been pretty hard on Gary and his family, and over the past few weeks I've noticed some pretty disturbing changes in his behavior. Changes that have meant that Gary went from being the Ned Flanders personality clone we love so much to being someone that I'm quite frankly terrified of. I remember when we first heard rumors of a lockdown coming, Gary came over to talk about it. He was his usual jolly self, laughing off the scaremongering coming from the media, but as we talked about a shortage on food and hand sanitizer becoming a reality, he grew unsettled in a way I'd never really seen before. Gary has two young kids, but he also has his elderly mother living with him. He once told me he just didn't have the heart to put her in a home, how that seemed way too much like abandonment. Gary was just that kind of guy. At least, he was that kind of guy. I only really started noticing the change when he came home one day with a trunk loaded with groceries. Not just the trunk, either. The back seat of his SUV was overloaded with paper grocery bags. Some were loaded with meat and vegetables, some stacked entirely full of canned goods, but it was the box full of hand sanitizer that really made me take notice. Gary was the polar opposite of a germaphobe. Like, polar opposite. He routinely ignored the five-second rule when it came to barbecue items dropped into lawn grass, and was very much of the opinion that letting kids play outside, letting them eat a little dirt from time to time, was just good for their immune system. It'd make them tough in a way that playing with screens just wouldn't. We actually used to laugh at people who kept those little Purell bottles and hip holsters, overly paranoid losers who would drive their cars off a bridge if they really knew how many microorganisms lived in their eyelashes alone. But here Gary was, unloading an entire pallet of hand sanitizer from his truck. Got some to spare, huh, buddy? I shouted over from my porch. Not at the prices I just paid, he replied. Seems... Innocuous, I know, but if you knew Gary, you'd be just as interested to note that this reply didn't come with a smile or a chuckle. He barely even looked at me as he took the supplies inside. But things only really took a turn for the worse when one of Gary's kids took a tumble while playing in the street outside their house. They were playing on the new bike, riding around in circles when I guess they just lost their balance and fell hard onto the concrete. You could tell it was a bad fall from the way they let out this pained, shocked cry before bursting into tears. My wife was out on the porch at the time, sipping an iced tea and saw the whole thing. I had heard the scream but wasn't sure what happened until I saw my wife grabbing the first aid kit we keep in a kitchen cabinet. I followed her outside into the street but as she approached Gary's kid, the man himself was stood in his front doorway. In the sternest voice I'd ever heard out of the man, he told my wife to get away from his kid. I guess she understand what he meant. As she stopped just short of the crying child, took a few steps back and then slid the first aid kid across the concrete in her direction. Gary's other kid was old enough to know what that first aid kit was, but as he tried to pick it up off the ground, Gary erupted at him to not touch that frickin' thing and to get back inside the house. My wife apologized for her hastiness, but assured Gary she had the best of intentions. And for the first time in four or five years since we'd moved into the neighborhood, I actually found myself getting angry with him. He didn't even acknowledge my wife's apology, giving us both a contemptuous look as he closed and locked the front door behind him. A few days later, 
We saw the same kid who fell wearing a makeshift sling and looked pretty miserable. It took us a while to put two and two together, but we did, and we realized that Gary hadn't, nor had any intention of taking his kid to the hospital to get their arm looked at by a doctor. It was only then did it really hit me just how bad this whole pandemic thing was affecting him. He wasn't just taking precautions as the rest of us were. He seemed to be going full-on survivalist, like the guy's entire personality had shifted over what was apparently just the course of a week or so. It was disconcerting to say the least. Then, just a few nights ago, my wife shook me awake to tell me she could smell something burning. I literally fell out of bed thinking she was telling me our house was on fire, but she assured me it wasn't and that she could just smell something. As my senses came to life, I began to be able to smell it too, this acrid, smoky smell that was obviously something being burned. It only took me one look out of our bedroom window to tell me where it was coming from, an orange glow emanating from across the street. There was a fire in Gary's backyard. The smell wasn't just bothering us either. Almost every bedroom light of every house in the block was switched on, and I could see some similarly irritated neighbors floating by their windows trying to find out where the stench was coming from. I decided to just suck it up, go over, and ask him to put the fire out. God knows what he was burning, but I knew from the smell that it wasn't healthy. But no sooner had I crossed onto Gary's half of the street, he appears from his backyard gate. At least I figured it was Gary. I couldn't see his face. It was covered up with one of those old Gulf War era gas masks, the kind with the big round glass eyes that made him look more simian than human. That, along with the 12 gauge shotgun that he had firmly in his grip, sent a shiver of fear running through me. Get away from my house, Martin! His words were muffled by the mask, but it was clear what he said. Gary, buddy, that fire is... Get away from my house, Martin! He never called me Martin, always Marty. It was the first time I'd ever heard him call me by my actual name. I just did the smart thing. I backed off, hands raised, slow enough to keep him from freaking out and shooting me dead right there in the street. I haven't talked to or seen Gary for the past few days, and I'm more than willing to give him the space he and his family need, if that's what it takes for him to stay sane. But please, if any of your neighbors are suffering right now, please reach out to see if they're okay, if they need anything at all, even if it is just for you to keep your distance. I'm sure Gary will be fine in time when all of this stuff is calmed down. I hope he returns to be the man I once knew and loved. Have y'all been following all these Zoom and Skype dates that have been happening since the lockdown started? As you imagine, the use of dating apps have skyrocketed since the government had ordered us all inside for the foreseeable future. Those who would usually flaunt their game in the club or at the gym are now forced to use the same tactics as the less socially adept of us in dating apps. And although I'm not entirely happy with the increased competition... I'd be lying if I said my match count hasn't bumped up a little. Silver linings, right? Anyway, instead of using Tinder or Hinge with their increased emphasis on physical appearances, definitely not my strong point given I'm about 30 pounds overweight right now, I opted for Reddit's R4R forum, which is full of posts from those who want to hook up for conversation, flirting, and occasionally even more. So, I put up this pretty dumb post basically asking if there were any girls that wanted to have, like, a lockdown date or whatever. I listed a bunch of my interests, mainly horror movies and a few political issues close to my heart, and implored anyone who identified with them to get in touch. One or two girls did, and I feel mean admitting this, but they just didn't seem particularly engaging. Nice, yes, charming, one really was, but our talks didn't light a fire in me. Not like the message I got in the wee small hours of the morning when I was up way past my usual bedtime. 
The message from a girl named Amber who wrote eloquently and charmingly about how she too was looking for something of a lockdown bay herself. She was highly politically involved, as she put it, which definitely sparked my interest. In sharp comparison with the two other girls who wrote back to me who didn't seem interested in politics. She was also extremely intelligent. The way she was able to articulate her thoughts was something I had rarely encountered in online interactions, which is also why I was so shocked when I found out she was only 18, 11 years my junior. Only, when she described herself, I started to get suspicious. She seemed perfect. Too perfect. She told me she was 5'7", Asian American, fit, and toned from yoga and spin class. In her own words, she was pretty cute. Catfish was the first thought that came to my mind. There was absolutely no way a girl as cute sounding as that would be getting in contact with me. So I just made a joke about it. Well, a joke that wasn't really a joke. I basically called her out on it. How she didn't have to pretend to be some hot Asian girl just to get my attention. Not with the kind of conversational skills that she did. The next message was just a link to an Imgur photo. A risky click, if ever there was one, as there was absolutely nothing in the way of a caption to clue me into what the picture was of. But I suppose curiosity just got the better of me, and I just clicked. For those that don't already know, a verification photo is when a person handwrites their username or other pertinent information on a piece of paper to prove that they are indeed who they say they are. And yep, you guessed it, the picture was verification. As it turned out, Amber was exactly who she claimed to be. Young, Asian, and impossibly gorgeous. I mean, I was literally stunned when I saw that picture of her. I just stopped and stared for what seemed like minutes. When it came to returning the favor, I was terrified. I am not in the least bit confident about my appearance, as I've made clear, and the idea of trying to take a selfie, something I'd never even done before that evening, was almost too much to bear. But I did it anyway. I combed my hair, washed my face, then went over my beard with the barely used trimmer my mom bought me for my 28th birthday, basically her way of telling me to get that stuff off my face. Then when I was done, I found my angle, took the photo, and then sent it over. The suspense, the raw suspense, oh my god. I honestly think the last time I was that nervous was before my first date I ever went on as a 17-year-old in high school. I'm talking that heart-racing, sweaty palm, time-slowing down nervous that makes you feel sick to your stomach. I was convinced I'd never hear from her again, that she'd see how mismatched this whole thing was and just up and ghost me. Only, she didn't. She actually replied saying that I was cute. That was three weeks ago now. We've talked every single day since then, sometimes having multiple hour-long phone calls that run into the wee small hours of the morning. And the more we talked, the more serious things became. At one point, Amber asked where she saw this going after lockdown was over. She told me she was living in Portland, whereas I was all the way over in the greater Boston area, pretty much opposite ends of the country to one another but she pretty much straight up raised the issue of us needing to act on the chemistry we had. I told her that money was no object, that she was legit the most beautiful, charming young woman I'd ever met in my entire life. It was true, I meant every word of it, but I understood when she told me that she heard that kind of thing all the time, that they'd tell her just about anything to get the chance to sleep with her, and I believed that too. She asked me how far I'd be willing to go to prove myself to her, I told her as far as she needed me to go. At that, she just laughed, telling me how she doubted it. I was indignant. I'd do anything. Everything she asked just to make her believe it. That's when she told me to get a knife. I'm ashamed to say that there was barely any hesitation. I just trusted her. I trusted that she knew what was best for me. She already seemed to be able to read me like a book. She asked if I had an envelope handy. I told her yes, that I had a pack of about a hundred crisp white envelopes. She told me to open it. I obeyed. She told me to place the blade of the knife onto my palm. I obeyed. And when she finally gave me the order, 
I pulled the blade across my flesh and let fresh blood flow onto the open envelope. It didn't even hurt. It was the strangest thing, but for the first few minutes there was no pain at all. Just this dull, hot feeling as I watched the blood flow from the open wound, staining the perfect white of the paper, a deep crimson. I held everything up to the webcam, showing her exactly how far I was willing to go for her. And oh my god, the look on her face, the way her pretty almond eyes seemed to light up, it just filled me with joy. I don't really know why I'm telling you this. I know it's making me sound crazy just as much as it's making her sound toxic. But in that moment, it all just made so much sense. Words are cheap, actions count for something, and there's no dearer currency than her own lifeblood. It seemed like the purest act of devotion imaginable, and for a while, I saw nothing wrong with it and had zero regrets. When it was done, she told me to buy a larger plastic envelope, one that'll properly conceal the blood-filled paper one. Then, I was to mail it to her. Again, it made a lot of sense. It was possible to fake something like that, I mean, pretty easily, so the idea that she wanted to see for herself, to verify that I'd be true to her, it was just second nature. As instructed, I paid extra for next day delivery, a lot extra, but it would be worth it. It felt like every penny I spent on this girl was worth it. Money can't buy something like we shared, at least. That's the way it felt at the time. I remember being so excited at the prospect of her opening that envelope, of seeing her satisfaction at knowing what I'd done for her. And when she saw, when she showed me her opening that thing over webcam, it was every bit as disgustingly glorious as I imagined. Her eyes lit up in that same adorable way, and she smiled in a way I'd never quite seen before. Such a wide, white smile. She giggled as she held it up, bringing a hand to her mouth, and in one fluid motion, she brought the blood-stained envelope to her lips and kissed it. Only, she didn't just kiss it. I watched transfixed as she began to lick at the dried bloodstains, spitting on them and lathering them with her tongue until the dried mess hydrated and formed a sticky crimson residue. Now writing this now, it's really obviously disgusting, but at the time, it seemed like love. It was the purest act of acceptance of another living being I'd ever witnessed. She was purporting to adore the very blood that ran through my veins, that even in a dried up, crusty state, she could invigorate it. It said so much with so little. The next day, we got into a conversation about cats. Amber loved kitties, as she put it. She had a bunch of clothes with cat designs on them, hair accessories that resembled cat girls. It was a whole theme for her. But since she was in college, living in a dorm room that she was basically trapped in due to lockdown, there was no way of her getting to own one. Now, for the first time being away, I confess that since my last girlfriend had broken up with me and moved out, I'd strongly been considering getting a pet to combat the crushing loneliness that came with a lifestyle such as mine. This revelation delighted her, and she asked if I would go get her one. I was confused at first, thinking we meant she wanted me to, like, send her a cat. I didn't think this was entirely out of the question. I mean, animal shelters would still need to run despite the COVID thing. There had to be a way I could find an animal shelter in her area and arrange to have one dropped off. But obviously, that's not what she meant at all. She wanted me to get a cat. I acquiesced to the idea pretty quickly. It did suit my plans, after all. But then the conversation took a weird turn. She asked me if I love kitties, so I told her yes. The truth is, I don't like them as much as dogs, but I wasn't about to overcomplicate the situation by saying that. Then she asked me which I liked more, her or cats. Again, I said her. Then she asked if I loved enough to hurt something innocent. I hesitated, but again, I said yes. Then came those fatal words that now don't seem so loving anymore. Prove it, she told me, in no uncertain terms, that she wanted me to prove that I loved her more than any other living creature. 
She didn't want me to get into any trouble to ruin my career by getting a criminal record or anything, but she still wanted proof. It was horrifying, listening to her talk. She had obviously thought this out, maybe even long in advance. She told me I could get a really old cat from a rescue center, one that was near the end of its life anyway, one that might well be suffering from joint pain or breathing trouble. She told me to look at it like an act of mercy, one that would prove I was the right man for her, one that could make difficult decisions and own them too. And I'm ashamed to admit, I agreed to every word. I found that local animal shelters in my area were still indeed operating. I called one to ask them a few questions regarding the adoption process and found it would be infinitely easier than I even expected. I could pay them a visit and leave with the cat the very same day. Then it came to asking my own rather tailored set of questions. I told her that I wanted to give an older kitty a comfortable time in its twilight years, that I was something of a feline philanthropist and had been doing so for many years. It was heart-wrenching, hearing that rescue center worker telling me what a good person I was, how no one wanted to adopt the older cats and how one would be so, so happy to have finally found someone to take care of them. I think that's what did it. The sobering moment that made me realize how stupid I'd been these past few weeks. How lust and desire and loneliness had driven me to the point where I was willing to relinquish my entire humanity. I had never hurt so much as a fly in my entire life and there I was. Planning to hurt an innocent, essentially defenseless animal. I knew I had to do something. I opted for a clean break. I thought about writing her a long goodbye message, explaining how I'd come to that decision, hoping it wouldn't hurt her feelings too much, but then, it occurred to me that she didn't really have feelings, not like you or I might do. She had a fixation on what she could do. It all made sense in that context. She got off on power, on manipulation, and any way she could achieve that was justified. I blocked her on Discord, deleted the email account I'd used to send her long stream of consciousness letters from. It hurt. It hurt really, really bad at first, but once I told myself she'd easily find a new partner, a new victim, the decisions became much, much easier to deal with. So please, people, learn from my stupid, short-sighted mistakes. Don't let this lockdown loneliness get the better of you, because... There are people out there, bad people, just waiting to exploit it. I've been reading a lot of stories recently about how Mother Nature is basically reclaiming the land since this whole lockdown thing went into place. In particular, one story that comes out of the UK which talks about how a giant herd of wild goats has essentially taken over a small Welsh town. It's pretty charming, detailing how these rare Kashmiri goats have seized the opportunity that's been presented by people staying indoors to roam down from the hills to wander around neighborhoods, devouring the contents of flower boxes and front gardens alike. There are also those stories about the swans returning to the canals out in Venice Beach, but you can go read up on them yourself, as I've got a point to get to here. Okay, so little side note here. Has anyone else noticed how nice the weather has gotten since the lockdown started? God, it's been so frustrating. Shut indoors while the weather went from grey and windy to warm and sunny, like what well, must have been a matter of days. In all my life, I've honestly never seen spring slam into winter with such a dramatic transition. It's been tough on my little girl, too. She's been dying to get out to the local park to play on the jungle gyms, and telling her no, not to mention explaining why, has been harder and harder as the weeks have gone by. I can't tell her the truth, because I knew it would absolutely terrify her. Breaking down, there are little creatures living inside of us, waiting to be transmitted to someone she loves like Pap Pap or Nana, which could end their lives. How do you even say that to a child without them totally freaking out? So, our story starts with bird watching. I know, boring, but try telling that to my daughter. She burned through all her DVDs and favorite YouTube channels in like a week, and despite some of them having 
palpable rewatch value to them, she quickly grew tired of staring at a screen for hours on end. It got way, way worse, and we started having to tell her no about going to the park. Seems like once you hold something out of reach of a kid, it's all they want from then on, the forbidden thing. I found a happy compromise with her, in that if she stayed inside, she could look at the garden all she wanted. And the bonus was that if she stayed super still and quiet, that all kinds of birds and other critters would wander into the garden for her to look at. And you know what? It actually got kind of fun after a while. I actually fished out an old native birds of the upper American East Coast that I'm pretty sure was my grandpa's at one point. And we got to work ticking off each one we saw. Working our way through the book as common and rarely seen birds alike landed among the flower beds of our backyard. One evening, I'd swear I saw something larger moving around the trees at the back of our yard, but I figured it was just a trick of the light, maybe a neighbor's dog moving against their back fence, casting shadows into ours. But a few days later, I discovered it wasn't just my imagination. I was doing some laundry upstairs while my daughter busied herself with bird watching. I'd ordered a cheap pair of kids' binoculars from Amazon and those things really had paid for themselves by the evening of the day they arrived. My kid was obsessed with them. She had them practically strapped to her face for the entire day, looking at everything and anything up close and being amazed at the results. So she was only happy to sit in front of the patio window doors and will away the hours by checking out the wildlife at close range through her new binos. And thank God, because... Having to keep an eye on her day in and day out was meaning housework was mounting up and at the top of the list was laundry. So I'm working through piles of dirty clothes, calling down to her every so often to see how she was doing, and everything seems to be going fine. Every so often I'd rush down when she claimed to have spotted a new kind of bird in our garden. Often I'd have to point out that it was one we'd seen before, but once or twice we actually locked eyes with a lesser spotted woodpecker a bird we most definitely hadn't spotted before. Only, when I heard her cry out, Kitty, I figured she must have gotten kind of bored of watching for birds. At first I was a little worried. The last thing I wanted was for my little girl to witness a full-on bird murder in her own backyard, but I was quietly reassured by the fact that all the neighborhood cats were fat and spoiled and they wouldn't be finessing at backyard birds anytime soon. That was for certain. Suddenly I heard a kind of thump against the window doors like my daughter had hit her hand against the glass super hard. I called down to tell her not to hit the glass as it would scare all the birds away and they might not come back to visit. Her answer made me drop the laundry basket and hurtle downstairs. I didn't. It was the kitty. But that thump was loud, bigger and louder than anything a simple house cat could make. It was so weird to write back now, but I distinctly remember just not thinking at all. Just sort of flying into action. This white-hot urge to protect, 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 just turning me into more machine than woman. And what do I see the moment I turn the corner into the living room? I see my daughter, standing at the glass doors, staring at an actual mountain lion in the face. The huge cat had its paw half-cocked, as if I didn't already have an idea that it was the one making that banging noise against the glass. I ran toward my little girl with such speed and aggression that the mountain lion jumped back for a second. The inherent danger of the situation, danger that she seemed to be completely unaware of previously, caught up with her and hit her like a freight train. She started bawling, screaming, realizing in a white hot moment that Kitty didn't want to play. Kitty wanted to rip and tear. That the Kitty wasn't a Kitty at all. Once it realized I'd taken away its intended prey, the mountain lion took a few more swipes at the glass and only rushed out the backyard once I started banging pots and pans together real loud, just like my grandpa had showed me years before. I guess this was just a long-winded way of saying to keep a real close eye on the woods and green spaces when this lockdown is over. It might not be entirely safe for our kids to be playing in places that have obviously been reclaimed by wildlife, and dangerous wildlife 
at that. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, happy birthday, Robin.